Good evening, welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. I have Andrew Gant with me, the co-founder of Wyzant, a great Chicago company that you may have seen in the news lately after taking uh, more than $20 million from Excel uh, Partners. Drew, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. All right, welcome. <laughs> so now we can hear him. All right, so for the uninitiated, for people who don't know Wyzant, what does Wyzant do? Yeah, so Wyzant in its simplest form is a marketplace for <laughs> private tutoring and lessons. Um, we basically have, are operating in an industry that's been around forever, um, but it's been broken for a long time and uh, approaching it with a new model. And, um, you know, we kind of consider ourselves part of the sharing economy, if you will, although I, I literally just wrote an article about how that's a terrible name for it. But, uh, yeah, we're, all the people who say they're the Airbnb for something, you know, I would say we're the Airbnb for tutoring, although we were around before Airbnb, so I think Airbnb is a wise end of hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a lot of people refer to them that way. I yeah, of course. So. Yeah, you've never heard that before? Uh, <laughs> so, and why not, the, why is it not, the, why the sharing economy, why is that the wrong way to describe it? Well, so the article is actually on entrepreneur.com. This is like shameless self-promotion. But uh, it's, in my opinion, the, what makes the sharing economy important is, or, or effective, are concepts of participa participation and utilization. So. If you think about Airbnb, let's use that as an example. Now, more people are able, actually let's use Uber as an example. More people are able to participate in this, in, in getting a private driver. Um, so that's kind of the concept of participation. And more, more people are able to um, seek employment on the supply side as drivers. Um, in our business, more people are able to find tutors and get tutoring. Um, with the marketplace approach, we've drastically improved the economics, the traditional economics in the, in the industry. To, so tutors are able to make more money, and the overall cost to students is much less. So more people are able to access tutoring. And on the supply side, more people are able to participate as, as tutoring, um, as tutors, because they don't have to uh, market themselves. And um, we handle all the business side of, of being a private tutor. Got it. Cool. Well, so it's an interesting idea. When did you guys found it? Started Wyzan in 2005, which, so, you, so we've so been, been around for a while. All right, so cool. You've been both. So where the, it's a really cool idea. It's obviously got great traction now. Where did the idea come from? So it's one of those companies that was born out of a personal experience. So you want the long story or the short story? Uh, whatever's the most interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the medium story. So basically, <laughs> I went to college at, uh, at Princeton, and one of the observations I always had at Princeton was how it always struck me that you know, the very talented students, and they were working in the library or the cafeteria making eight, ten dollars an hour, and then they would graduate and go to consulting or banking and make a hundred thousand dollars a year, and that didn't make any sense. Um, so it, it felt underutilized, to use that word again. And um, anyway, just kind of put that aside. So I graduated college, and I, I got swept up in the whole finance thing, which everyone was doing from Princeton, everyone would go work on Wall Street, so I did that. And uh, I hated it. It like was so you did definitely. Like a, you did like a summer internship, right? I did the summer internship. Then they dangle a ten thousand dollars signing bonus in front of you, and so you're you're it's going into your senior year. Right? It's more money than you could ever imagine. So you, you sign up and you take the ten thousand dollars and you spend it naturally during right, your so, senior so year. So hold on, hold on. So what'd you do with the ten thousand dollars? Let's. I actually went story. to. I, so I did a semester in Ireland and jets. Well, jet set is not the right word, but I was I traveled around Europe during that time. So how many pints of Guinness does ten thousand dollars? <laughs> a lot, a lot. <laughs> so. Anyway, upon reflection during my senior year of college, I realized you know, I really didn't enjoy my investment banking internship, and this is not really the right fit for me. I was not fulfilled, but I felt like I had to take the job. I had spent this money. I had no way of repaying it. So I went and I showed up, and, and on the first day of work, I was like, you know, I shouldn't be here, and uh, I quit the second week of training. I figured, you know what, I'll figure out a way to pay this back. And, um, so you just spent whatever, a quarter million dollars on going to Princeton. You have ten thousand. You're ten thousand dollars in the hole, and you leave your job with the investment bank. And your plan was what? Was nothing. I literally had never <laughs> thought about what I actually wanted to do. It was like, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what everybody else yeah, is doing. That's that's a gutsy move. I love it. Yeah, you know, it sounds gutsy and, and it sounds very glamorous. But honestly, it was not like I was not in a good place at the time. I was. <laughs> I I felt like I had let my parents down. My my friends. I had moved in with some friends in, in, in New York, and I was just abandoned them and. Um, obviously, Merrill Lynch, that was kind of the least of my concerns, was letting Merrill Lynch down. Um, <laughs> but uh, they were yeah, so, so I go back to Maine and move in with my parents, which is where I grew up. And again, not in like a particularly good place, not where I pictured myself after graduating, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I uh, spent literally like six weeks just 
mentally grinding. What am I going to do with myself? And I said, you know, I, in the meantime, I need to do something. And I, again, it was back to this fulfillment thing. Um, I, I wanted to do something that I could feel good about. So I said, well, I'm good at math, and I, you know, I would enjoy interacting with students. I'll be a math tutor, and at least to bridge the gap. Who knows what I'll ultimately do? So I set out to be a math tutor, and, and the very first observation was like, man, this is really hard to promote myself and get business as a math tutor. Uh, finally got some clients, and, and literally like every single one of them said, oh, I wish I had found you six months ago or last year. It's so hard to find qualified tutors. So I was like, okay, right away, two very important observations there. Um, and then I, I kind of re I, I returned to the other observation from college where I said, man, like college students would actually make great tutors. They have a perfectly parallel skill set to what a high school student might need. Um, and, and these kids are you know, very smart and motivated. So then I had, I had these three things that I didn't really know what to make of them all. And I, at, at that point, I called up my now co-founder, uh, Mike, Mike Wazoon, who was a, a t computer science guy at Princeton. And ran this by him. I'm starting to see where the name comes from. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so he immediately kind of latched onto this marketplace thing. He gets all the credit for the, the business model. And uh, yeah, that's how, that's how we got started. So, you're, uh, so you see this opportunity. We talk about founder market fit a lot on founder stories. And you know, a lot of people want to say, I'm looking for a great idea. But I'm, I'm struck by, if I think about the last Excel company we had here, was uh, Raintree, Brian Johnson, which ended up with a billion dollar outcome, including earn out and a great, great success story. But I have to say the interesting thing about their success story was that um, Brian understood that space in a way because Brian had been you know, in, working in that, in that business. And I think about you, you know, you've been a college student looking to make money, you, you went to look for tutoring, you found the people. That, that whole founder market fit piece, sounds like you really had that going in and sort of saw it from, from the bottom up. So it seems like you should get great traction to start, but how's, where's the story go from there? How do you end up? Um, well, you know, we'll come back to that. You, were you likely to be an entrepreneur? I mean, as you think about yourself as a kid, do you, do you see things? Did your neighbors say, oh, I knew he'd always be? Yeah, Bruce. so people used to ask me that. I used to, try, I used to make shit up. I used to, like, literally be <laughs> like, I must have had some tendencies as a child to be an entrepreneur. I honestly didn't. Um, so for all of you who m might be thinking, like, you know, oh, I'm not some whiz kid coder. Or I haven't had all these businesses since age seven. You know, I, I really, I was competitive. Um, and... You know, I, I was lazy, <laughs> like, um, and inefficiency always bothered me, and I think that so may be one of the... talk about that, because when we, we talked before, that was one of the interesting things. I think, you, uh, I think you talked about, you know, just used to drive you crazy to see things that are inefficient. Talk about that as a tendency, because it seems like that's what, what ultimately motivated you to start this. Yeah, I'm, and I, I, I don't have any great examples off the top of my head. Um, I used to skip a lot of college classes. I guess that would be one that felt like a waste of time. Um, but yeah, that was what happened when I saw this tutoring thing that just felt totally broken. I said, there has to be a better way. And I think that's a sentiment that a lot of founders feel. It's like, you know, it wasn't an epiphany necessarily, but it's like something is wrong here. Right. Yeah, so that's, so it's interesting to kind of work through that. So you're in college, you think you're going to be on Wall Street, sort of the Princeton thing to do here. Um, and as you you know, were you around a lot of people? Was This was sort of the dot-com bust era. So did you have a lot of classmates that went into this, or was this kind of like you wandering off in, in the, into sort of uncharted territory? This is totally the latter. Like, we, um, unlike a lot of people now who are studying entrepreneurship, and, and there's all these great examples of tech companies. There were great examples in 2005 when we graduated, but we were not, a, we were not following them. Um, so we, we basically had, to, it was very homegrown. Like we had no idea what we were doing. We weren't following any sort of roadmap. People often ask us why we didn't raise capital. And I was like, because we didn't know you could raise capital. Like we didn't know that was a thing when we started Wiseman. So it was very much a learn on, you, on, on, the, on the fly sort of thing. All right, so you call your roommate who's got a job, right? Your old roommate, or now your current partner. You call him up, he's got a job, and most people with jobs, you know, it would be a little questionable. All right, you can't have both of us out of work. So how's this whole thing unfold? Yeah, so my original pitch was, I was like, man, we can start this business. You know, don't, I know you have a job and you're starting tomorrow, but don't worry about it. We got this. <laughs> and uh, he's, like, he's like, honestly, I've got all these student loans. I can't just bail on this job. I was like, fine. So I was in Maine. I was like, I need to get out of my parents' house anyway. I packed up my car and drove down to Northern Virginia, which is where he was working. We moved in together. And for six months, he worked on it at night. Um, and I worked on it all day. And in 
March of 2006, we had about $3,000 in monthly gross sales. So maybe $600 net to us. And we're like, oh, we made it. Like, we're, this is it. We're, we're the, this, this is the big huge. Time. We can live off of this. And we attempted to, and that, in fact, did. And, uh, but it was enough kind of product market fit in hindsight that uh, we felt like there was something there and, and took the plunge. So talk about it, because you guys do one of the things that I, I really enjoy, and I think they're fascinating. But everybody wants to be a marketplace. And you know, on a lot of levels, you look at successful marketplaces and say, this is a great time to create marketplace, and that's right. But it's still pretty hard. I mean, it's got to be less than 1% of marketplace ideas actually get traction and take off. And so how did you figure that out? Talk about the early days of making the two-sided network work, because it's a beautiful thing when it's, yeah. when it's liquid, but most people can never get there. So talk about the challenges you, and how you overcame them in, in getting both sides of this. And maybe explain to people a little bit about how both sides work in your marketplace. Yeah, sure. So the tactics at first were very guerrilla. We would, it was a lot of flyers, outdoor signs. Literally, we'd solicit people just on the street at, so let's, all, let's, at elections. Like. So let's break it down for a minute. So one side is parents or students looking to hire tutors. Yes, yeah, so the parents are the primary consumer. They make the consumption decision in our business. All right, so you got parents on one side, and on the other side you have tutors. And, and tutors, and at first it was college students. So we would market on colleges, like so flyers which, under which the window. So which came first, chicken or the egg? Which did you look for? Well, the, I don't know which is chicken or which is egg. The supply side is where we, we had to start because okay. otherwise, like, there wouldn't be any options for for the demand side that was looking for tutors. So we would basically we would go to college student parking lots on college campuses and flyer all those. All right, so people. what's the first one you went to? DC is a good town, a lot of a lot of colleges. What's the first one? I think it was George you Mason to? University. Okay. Yeah, and our first tutor was actually a piano teacher, which is ironic because that's like such a small part of our business. But uh, and how did you find the piano teacher? She, she, I don't know, she was parked in the right parking lot, I suppose. <laughs> so you go, you're basically out going back to college campuses, papering cars with flyers. Yeah, and then that n same night, we would go to the high school, fo high school football games, and assuming there's a lot of parents there like with our other stack of flyers. And that was how we drove demand. The nice thing about our business is the majority of the tutoring is in person. Back then, it was all in person. So like, we could create this hyper-local marketplace that had liquidity in just rest in Virginia or Fairfax, Virginia. Like, it worked. I mean, there was 50 tutors and, you know, 20 students a day, and it was like, it was actually functional. It wasn't big, but it worked because it was, it was local. And is it hard? I mean, so hyper-local rest in Virginia, that's that your first actual micro, sort of micro marketplace? Yeah, Northern Virginia generally was, was where we got it started, and that was kind of our sandbox. We right, learned so, so much. So the area around George Mason, though, in particular, was sort of where you were focused. Talk a little bit about that, because, you know, one of the things people like to say is, well, I just get a bunch. If I get enough people, it'll work. But, you know, you need people to match up, right? Oh, yeah. It was so, literally from that very first example of during the in the morning we go to, you know, work on the supply, and at night we'd work on the demand. It's always been like that. It, there's been a very conscious effort to manage both of those sides because otherwise you end up with a terrible experience for, in our case, tutors or the students or parents aren't finding, in, you know, the selection they're looking for. So, we, so how many people signed up, 50 that. people, tutors signed up to start? Yeah, within the first couple of weeks, we had 50 people on, on our you know, very rudimentary website. And, and, and then from the demand side, what did you learn? Was it people just snap right at it, or was it you know, some things to figure out and how to get the right mix of tutors or the right pricing model? Or what yeah, you know? well, the, the, our very first transaction failed, actually. We remember getting an email notification on like our old school BlackBerry being like, somebody actually tried to purchase something, yay, but they failed. <laughs> Error for whatever. Um, so there's just a lot of things we had to iron out, which if we were at scale, and we, we, had, we made so many mistakes, but on that super small scale, it didn't really matter. Um, so that was, that was probably like the number one um, benefit of going super small for a while. Um, but yeah, we learned things like, what's the LTV of our customers? What are conversion rates? Um, you know, so what channels what, work? At what point do you start thinking about lifetime value, though? Because I think it's, it's always interesting to talk about a business today. You know, you obviously have been very successful and you're talking to... Uh, venture capitalists talking about things like conversion rate and lifetime value. But at that early stage, those probably acronyms probably mean nothing to you. So how did you figure those, what, out what mattered? How did you figure out what mattered to each side? Like what are some of the things, you know, what are some things you blow a tire on and what are the, some of the things that you just got right right away that if you were doing this all over again, you'd say, boy, here's some things I really remember that I think would be helpful to do it again. Yeah, well, I would say we zeroed right in on 
CAC, LTV, we didn't know the terms at the time. We were like, what does it cost us to acquire a customer? And at that point, it was like, how much do flyers cost? How much does gas cost? That was the equation, but it was still the same thing you do with Google AdWords or any other online, more scalable marketing channel. So that was, that was kind of instinctive. Um, I mean, but we made a ton of mistakes on the product. Uh, this goes to kind of the nuance of marketplaces. So for instance, we thought that scheduling was going to be the main driver so that people, we thought that it would be this great experience to be able to see the tutor's calendar and dynamically pull an hour or two hours from their calendar and our calendar would adjust and carve out enough travel time. If they're five miles away, we'd put 10 minutes buffer on each side and all this nonsense. We spent like six months developing this thing and like the tutors wouldn't keep their calendar updated. So it's a complete waste. And uh, now we kind of understand the agile, like, you know, lean startup MVP approach. So we, we would have tested that a bit earlier. But uh, yeah, the product just, you know, the iteration was, um, uh, we, we failed at our first few attempts at the model. Uh, we were always the payment processor in the arrangement. So we always had revenue coming in, which was huge. And in our case too, we actually would, we would, we'd sell these packages. So people would prepay $1,000 for tutoring for the semester and we would pay the tutor out over the, the six months. So we had this negative working capital, which was an amazing dynamic for us and allowed us to reinvest that money in marketing and not have to raise capital. So at what point, I mean, listen, I, I made more product mistakes than every founder combined, I think. But, you know, one of the things that you work through is you have this idea, you're like, it makes so much sense, it's so logical. And then, of course, you over-engineer the solution relative to what you need to know. Yeah, of course. So you... You know, you, you have the thing where you get the calendar thing wrong. Like, what are the things as you as you went through and you kind of figured this out were like the critical moments at which you kind of say to yourself, boy, I see how we could really get this thing, you know, moving fast, further faster. Yeah, so the one, th this, in, again, in hindsight, it's totally obvious. But you got to keep in mind, 2005, there, there was no Airbnb um, or right. Uber, right? The, these, these marketplaces weren't as them. common. Right. So the one epiphany moment we had was actually managing the communication between the tutor and the student through our platform. Otherwise, before that, we were just you know, punting it to their personal email and letting them interact. But obviously, one of the challenges our business faces is trying to keep that, that business on the platform. And the communication engine was fundamental to that, because it'll let us like, target the, the students, for instance, or the parents at the exact right time and say, hey, add your credit card. or on, on the. So this is part of, like, are you a platform or are you like a classified service almost, right? So how do you, how, I mean, thinking about that, because, you know, um, you know, you could become, if you're not careful, a Craigslist. And yeah. it's hard to out Craigslist, Craigslist. Yeah, no, there's a, and that was the one competitor we had at the time. That was the only service where you could list yourself as a tutor. But uh, So how would you navigate that? Well, so the pay, actually payment processing in our business is, is one of the big value adds. Uh, because the, the tutors aren't business people. They don't want to be hassling with that. And, and the parents, to be able to just put a credit card on file and not have to worry about cutting a check or having the right amount of cash or whatever it may be. So in and of itself, our model was, was adding incremental value. But we needed to figure out ways to add a lot more value to justify our role in this arrangement. And so that's really what we've been doing ever since is, you know, the, the first thing, we actually figured out how to do the scheduling engine, for instance. The communication platform was pretty slick. Um, and then reporting and so what, was the key, what was the key insight into figuring out, because you said you got the communication thing wrong at first, in terms of what they were looking at, just their emails. What became the key insight? Like, what was the insight you got from that let you really understand how to unlock that as a key? So the, mo the biggest thing for us was the, our, if you look at our funnel, like, the, what you have to do if you're a parent or trying to hire a tutor, you can, you can email with that tutor and get your questions answered very seamlessly, which is important because you want to evaluate these people. But you can't exchange your phone number. If you try to spell it out or you try to type it in, you know, it'll, it'll kind of exit out. And so there's not really a great way to connect with this, these people offline. And so that was kind of the, the biggest piece of that communication engine. So then we would say, okay, you want to exchange your phone number, just add your credit card, we won't charge anything. But just that, that act psychologically of putting your credit card on a file made them that much closer to being a paying customer through Wizen as opposed to outside of Wizen. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So you get this thing going, you got some, obviously some early good traction down in Virginia. What was your, at what point did you think you were ready for a second market? Not just a hyper-local market, but like a metro area market. So if you, it was really around the, the, going from the gorilla phase of our customer acquisition to the uh, understanding Google AdWords was honestly our first scalable uh, channel of customer acquisition, and we would start out. We had like $200 budget, you know, just understand what are keywords, what are our CPCs, conversion rates, etc. And once we we realized that we had this magic equation that just worked and produced, you know, an ROI. How long was, did it take you to figure that out? It was probably this was probably two, end of 2006. 
when we graduated from windshield wiper flyers to Google AdWords. Actually, in between, there was this period where we totally abused Craigslist. Like, <laughs> speaking of Craigslist, so the, back then there weren't as many any rules around it, so we were just like hundreds of posts a day on the on the supply and demand side. That was that was very scalable. Unfortunately, eventually it got uh, shut down. Um, but uh, yeah, then it was Google AdWords, and and that was huge for us. That's great. So, so you figured out Google AdWords. How do you pick a second market? I throw a dart. I don't know. We again, we wasn't super scientific. Like New York is a big market. People care about education. <laughs> it's only a three-hour drive. Like uh, that was kind of the logic that went into it. But it was yeah. We we basically went after New York, and again, it was online. So we we weren't we weren't pounding the pavement. So we could do this remotely. Uh, we, we did move to New York thinking that we had to be there. But uh, in practice. You know, all subsequent markets were just a matter of, of unleashing these online channels um, in other markets. Did you ever have much risk around, you know, one of the things you talk about in marketplaces is disintermediation. They say, okay, great, now I've got a relationship with this person, so I'll tell you what, I'll give you a discount, if, or why don't you just pay me? Um, this was an early eBay challenge. Yeah, did, totally. Did you, did you guys experience that at all? A absolutely. It's the, it's the one fundamental challenge with our business model, um, and it's there's still a portion of the business that, you know, the gray market we call it, or leakage, or whatever, but uh, it still happens. And, and the way we approach it is high level, let's add value to our users' experience that they wouldn't have outside the platform. So let's make it worth their while to stay on the platform. Uh, let's align incentives, which has a lot to do with pricing, so we're t always tweaking that. Um, the more actually like effective way to handle it in our case was with, what's algorithmically. So if you're a tutor and you're either, let's say you're either a really bad tutor or you're cheating the system. In either case, like the data will flow back to us and suggest, wow, this tutor is underperforming. So naturally, our algorithms are going to send future business to the tutor that's being loyal and productive on the platform. So that's how we actually handle it in practice. Got it. Interesting. And uh, how do you measure the, the success or happiness of each side? You know, because this seems like an evolving market you're in, the world's changing. How do you keep abreast given it's all virtual? How do you get satisfaction? How do you get a sense of should you be trying to you know, look at different trends? How do you, you know, the virtual is really cool, but how do you keep pulse? So have you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with net promoter score. Um, sure. That's been actually an amazing metric for us over the last year or so, uh, being able to gauge that across different cohorts and you know, time series. And after the 20th lesson, are you more or less happy than you are after the 10th lesson? That's been a really important approach to that problem. And what have you learned about what works and why it works without giving secrets away to the competition? In terms of what the... Yeah, like what, what insights have you gotten about how your market's evolving? Have any, do, you, do you feel like you've got it nailed? Is, your, is, your world, is the world moving, do you think? Well, sir, one way to answer, like if you look at the subject mix. So uh, we are a marketplace and we basically let supply and demand kind of dictate the direction we go and we, we then reinvest behind that. But uh, for instance, over the last couple of years, uh, like professional development areas we're seeing really taking off. So whether that's, I, wanna, I need to learn Microsoft Excel or how to code, mm. or um, you know, I, I need to get retrained in whatever skill it may be. That area of our business is growing a lot. So we say, okay, like this is happening. It's eBay did this a lot too. Um, you know, they, they, realized, they saw what was working and they said, okay, like let's re invest behind that. It's one of the nice things about a marketplace. And how does the pricing for the tutors work? So again, true marketplace, tutors set their own rates, um, which is great. So that takes into account geography, you know, experience. Um, Did you give any marketplace guidance? Or very little. Assessment? Very little. We, we, we stay pretty hands off there. And then the other feature of our pricing is the more hours you accumulate as a tutor, the, more, the higher your pay rate. So we try to create some incentives to stick with the platform long term. So um, a question I've been dying to know the answer to is, does a Princeton degree get you higher, more dollars as a tutor? I was a badass tutor. I, I bet was you really were. Good. I yeah. bet you were. That was how we Listen, My kid needs a math tutor. I'll take a Princeton graduate. <laughs> I'd be probably terrible now. I don't remember any of that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, it was important. Do you, do you see things like that? I'm, I'm just kidding about Princeton. But do you, do you see that? Are there things that you, know, you can say to somebody, hey, if, if you're this, it actually helps? Or do you not want to try and send people to sort of Oh, yeah. We have, so data is an, a hugely important part of our business. So we can break it down by like, you know, Pro, if you have a profile picture versus not, but like not only that, but is it a headshot or is it, or is it, did you cut off your boyfriend or girlfriend? Like, you know, and there's there's some very like you know high correlations around um, how you present your profile, your title, your education is is a huge uh, you know. Factor. And do you share much of that with the marketplace, or is it just stuff you know that's interesting? In the we do because we want to encourage tutors to 
you know, put themselves in the best position to succeed. So how do you get that out there? So this was a big effort a, a year ago, was going through the site and creating all these, it was like this, we called it a tutor messaging project. How, what are the touch points we have with these users? How can we inf help inform them and give them the, the information they need to optimize their experience? Um, so it was, you know, email and on-site experience at the right point, or after your fifth lesson, let's say, like, we'll ping you with a certain message that says, because that's the point of time often where there's, like, an opportunity to, or psychologically, it's like, okay, I now know this person. I have a relationship with this person. So, like, the tendency might be, let's just work offline. So we'll ping you with the right messaging around our algorithm. Say, hey, remember, like, if you, you know, your, your average number of lessons per student is an important factor in our algorithm, that'll help you get more business and rank higher. and Just little things like that, just getting more sophisticated. Uh, that's cool. I, I remember talking, there's, we've had a couple of dating people at the talk at the dating sites and I said, what are the great insights? And they're like, well, men go for attractive women, which was not a big insight, but they said they had an interesting one, which was women, men who are divorced with kids do better than men who are divorced without kids. There are all these kind of inferences. Of course, the problem is if you spread that is people start inventing kids <laughs> for the dating site. So that's, that's the challenge in educating yeah. your marketplace. Um, so you go to New York, what's the next market? So then we kind of went pretty much shock. Well, we went to New York, uh, and then LA, Chicago, Houston was kind of the next group. And then it was pretty shotgun. It was like, let's open up all these online channels nationally. And at the time, you know, in hindsight, we maybe have, would have done it differently, but this was just two of us. Even it wasn't a roadmap. We didn't have a, any examples or case studies to, to realize how other people have gone about it. So. Um, there, was a, there was a time when we went shotgun where like the supply and demand and liquidity in, in the market wasn't exactly well balanced and, and so, um, but we were able to build it up quickly enough where it rebalanced and, uh, and now it's yeah, national obviously. And do you have to, and you know, I guess going nationally would it be hard to, those hyper local markets, do you get liquidity, do you measure liquidity in those? How do you figure, do you, do you, do you have to look at it in that sort of very Lincoln Park type market or is it Chicago, is it north side Chicago? And how do you figure that out when you're rolling out markets to know where you have to sort of prime the pump? Yeah, so I would say where it's an area we're not totally there yet. Uh, it's one of the one of the things that's on, that we need to get better at is being super sophisticated around um, hyper local supply and demand again because we went with the shotgun approach and it was it was very effective. But now it's like we're going back and taking a second pass. And we looked at some some uh, performance indicators recently around like different markets, and it was like. Boulder, Colorado, for whatever reason, just totally outperforms. And so we were hypothesizing, is that because of the university? Um, is that because of the demographics? Is that because there was three or four kick-ass tutors that for whatever reason just got the flywheel spinning? So trying to make a science out of that. So in, in hindsight, again, we would have done this on the front end, but we didn't have the resources or the, or the insight. And now so we're going back, taking a second pass, and that's really just beginning. So we're not, we're not even all the way there yet. You guys took a really interesting view to scaling. A lot of marketplaces are sort of, you know, throw a lot of fuel on the fire very early. You guys, I think at one point you said to me, I wanted to see if we, we wanted to see if the two of us could do the whole thing. That was the goal. We, we had this vision where we could just automate everything and sit back and watch, watch the money roll in. <laughs> so we, and we pushed it really far. So like in 2009, there was, we were doing maybe four and a half million dollars in gross sales and it was just two of us. And like the phone is blowing up and like the books are a mess and like the site is breaking and we're like, we're like basically we threw our hands like holy shit, like we need help. And it was, it was actually like bittersweet. It's like wow, this is kind of cool we're hiring an employee but this is like not really, this, was, this is against our goal. But it, honestly, it was an incredible exercise to try to fi figure out a way to automate everything because it allowed us to then have you know, what ended up being a really scalable approach. Yeah, it sounds like it. What were some of the big insights? Like if you were to do a marketplace again, you go, boy, some of the best things we did were, what would they be? Oh man, it's a tough question. Um, I, I think it goes back to the beginning, starting small, understanding the unit economics, um, you know, iterating on a small scale, so you don't tick off like hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, that, that was really like, and, and again, it was by, it was by accident because we didn't know anything about venture capital. <laughs> like there's been actually, so there's some good case studies here. There's been a few competitors that have come out, raised money. One called Tutor Spree, you guys may have heard of. Uh, they raised a million dollars from Sequoia. You know, they were, they were, were really hot. They were getting a lot of PR. But the problem was they didn't have time to learn all this, all the nuances that we had plenty of time to learn because there was two of us, it was cash flow positive. Um, and so there, and there was all this pressure, you got to grow, grow really fast and you couldn't nurture supply and demand across all these different subject areas. And so 
Uh, going slow at, at first was really important to us. And then obviously, like last year, we made the decision we want to go, go a lot faster. So. And so talk about the competitive landscape. Because I think it's interesting. One of the things a lot of people would say, well, you need venture to be able to, rate, to go, go, go. It's a land grab, right? And yet your insight, which makes a lot of sense to me, is that um, you know, the people who go, go, went, went too fast didn't, didn't learn the marketplace from the inside out, didn't understand micro markets and hyper local and, and the different markets within what you're doing. Talk about what you've learned from you know, seeing other people go a different way. Are there things where you look and go, boy, that was an advantage for them? Or obviously you talked about not learning the marketplace. And, and uh, who's your closest competitor and where, where do you see that? How do you see that all unfolding? Yeah, so to answer the first part of the question, um, you know, I would say that the number one thing for us um, was, you know, about not raising capital was the fact that it was 2005. Like, <laughs> there, this is a totally different year. So I would never, I would not just carte blanche advise all companies to, to bootstrap necessarily. We had a huge early movers advantage. Like I said, the, the entire industry was super antiquated. And we intentionally flew under the radar for a long period of time, didn't do any PR. Like, we felt like we were onto something. We didn't want anyone to know about it. So we had, it was a pretty unique opportunity to have incredible first movers advantage. So I, I would not necessarily, again, so there are cases though where obviously bootstrapping makes a ton of sense. So that would be the, my first um, response. The second piece about the competitive landscape, um, yeah, there's, it's a very crowded space. It's a big industry, like $8 billion in the US alone, almost approaching $100 billion globally, private tutoring. Tutoring is actually quite small in this country relative to GDP compared to most com countries internationally. And why is it? I think that, you know, one thing actually is I think there's a stigma attached to tutoring still in this country. It's like tutoring is for the kid who's failing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, that's one of the things that we're trying to change. Like everyone should hire a tutor. That's one of our core values. It's like I've hired plenty of tutors. Um, whether it's like we're going on a trip and I want to learn a foreign language or, you know, I need to brush up on SQL or whatever it may be. Like, um, so, so that's one of the reasons. Um, and also, like, our, as our country and our education system gets more aligned to, you know, common core and it's, it's going to become a more test-driven education system, whether we like it or not. Um, it's going to be about mastery. And so internationally, there's these huge tests that, like, are going to, at age 8, or 10 or 12 can like dictate your, the rest of your life. And so there's this tremendous pressure at a young age to, um, to prepare for these tests. And that's what spawns these huge tutoring industries in countries like South Korea, um, Turkey. So what's the potential? How big can this get? Um, you know, internationally, if you, if, which is on the roadmap, probably in the next you know, 12 months or so, we're going to start going. That's one that we will go market by market internationally for sure. Um, well, Excel certainly thinks it could be a big company. We, we do, too. It's, uh, marketplaces are better when they're bigger, and we've seen that. Like, every metric improves the bigger we get because there's more liquidity. Um, so what I don't know. This time, be time will tell. What, what do you think this could be someday? Like, what? We, you were to sit back and say in 20 years, if we hit the ball out of the park, this is what we think it could be. Yeah, just I guess I'll use my favorite company again. I think it's an Airbnb-type opportunity. Whether we'll get there or not, you know, we'll, we'll see. That's cool. That's cool. So somehow you're moving around a lot, and, but you end up in Chicago. How'd that happen? Yeah, so I wish I could say it was super calculated. It was, it, was like, holy, it was like, this is really cool. We're young. There's two of us. We have an internet company. We can live anywhere. Um, we have a lot of friends in Chicago. <laughs> that was it. That was kind of the, the <laughs> rationale. This was 2008, so we moved out here. And it, it had, we, we were totally incapable of looking more than a month ahead. Probably even like two weeks. That was our max. Had we looked two months ahead, we realized that that whole like throw the hands up in the air moment happened right after we moved here. We need to hire employees. Next thing you know, we have eight employees working out of our, our, our living room in our apartment, and our roommates weren't like totally thrilled about that. So then we're like, oh, we need an office space. Now we have a, now we have a lease, and before we know it, we're in Chicago. And so this is, again, 2008, 2009, like, you know, pre all of this incredible activity that's happened in, in the Chicago tech scene in the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, it wasn't calculated, but it turned out to be an incredible place to, to build a business. In our business, we have a huge customer support arm. That's something we've invested in and made a conscious choice to ha have our phone number everywhere on the website, encourage people to call and interact with us. Um, that, that's something we wouldn't have been able to do in San Francisco between rents and cost of living and, and other things. Um, engineering, you know, we've had a lot of success, like, finding great engineers here. So it's, it's turned out to be an incredible place. And uh, talk a little bit about that decision. You know, 
if you go to the Valley, that you know, there's a feeling that the more, you know, in, business models without employees are better than business models with people in them. Um, you guys made a conscious choice to to put service in. I mean, try and find that number for Apple on the website. Right. It's pretty dang hard. What what got you to see that as a not just a necessity but a real advantage? Yeah, so I was a one man customer service department for three years, and uh, honestly, that was critical to getting user feedback and you know adding that was that was really probably the number one thing that was important at the time but also just adding this human element our business is so personal you're you're talking about a relative stranger coming to your home working with your child oftentimes it's like an emotionally charged situation where the kid's falling behind or the kid has some big test and he's stressed out so you know to talk to a human and a, a, an intelligent thoughtful like caring person who can kind of walk you through the situation is, is really meaningful in our business so that, that was a, I think it's the right kind of positive ROI business decision for us. And as it moved beyond you, one of the challenges in a startup is, you know, nobody cares like the founder. You obviously are highly skilled. You have the empathy. You're focused. How did you translate that into the people who talk to your customers or touch them? Yeah, so I, it started by just hiring super quality people. Like, it never, the word call center, like, you know, it was, it continues to not even, like, resonate with us. Like, that makes me think of Comcast. In our, in our business, like, customer service is fundamentally involved, and, and there's ideation and involvement um, in, in the process and the roadmap. And, um, again, that, that's just, like, how, how we started because that was the role I have. So I have a tremendous appreciation for the, how, how valuable that can be. Got it. Great. Um, so... You raised some money. You had a lot of publicity with that. Talk about the decision to raise money and the process of raising money, how you ended up where you ended up, both on who you're with. And... Yeah, so I, it was a fascinating experience for me personally. Um, we were fortunate. We had received a lot of inbound interest from VCs in the starting probably like 2010 through 2012. So we, had, we knew there was interest. And how'd they know about you? I don't know, they have just like armies of associates just scouring the web trying to find interesting companies. Um, I, I have no idea, but because uh, we weren't doing, again, we weren't doing any PR. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the decision to raise capital was us realizing, again, start, we looked two weeks ahead for, for five years. <laughs> we started looking a month ahead. And then when we finally picked our heads up, you know, maybe a couple years ago, we realized, holy cow, this is a really massive opportunity. It's a huge market. We have a tremendous lead. We have really you know, incredible liquidity within our marketplace. We have this amazing stable of tutors who've done millions of hours with us and hundreds of thousands of ratings and reviews and data. It's like, we should win this market. And this market should be aggregated. It does, it, it's, it's got all of the characteristics of a market that should be rolled up and improved with technology and with the marketplace. So it, 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 I don't know why it took us five years to kind of like, or six, seven years to have that epiphany. But when we did, we said, okay, like, and also, at the same time, there's competition was starting to heat up a little bit. There's more activity. Um, our, our kind of like, you know, really pretty rare situation where we're the only people in the space that was changing. So we said, all right, like we, we need to move faster. We want to go big. Um, and uh, and yeah, that was so we started, said, like obviously raising capital is a, a, a way to do that. Grow, for us, it's about growing the team and allowing us to move quicker with more throughput and ultimately unlocking some different marketing channels where we can uh, you know, allocate some of that capital. So why Excel? A great company, great firm. I mean, well respected, worked well here. Facebook made them famous. What, yes. Why the, them though? You the know, short answer is marketplace domain expertise and also ed tech. So they're in um, Etsy is probably their mo you know most famous marketplace. Uh, but uh, Ninety Nine Designs is another one that they're in. So they, and there there's several other examples on the uh, ed tech side. Lynda.com. If you guys know Lynda, um, is one of their key investments. Newton is another one. So they had this nice blend. And, and for us, too, like cult, the cultural fit was really important. Um, there are a lot of different personalities, let's say, in the, in the venture space. And uh, you know, for us, we said, like, we don't want this to drastically change you know, the culture. And um, that was actually that filter. So there's all these filters you apply, right? And that one allowed us to weed out like 90%. It's like, clearly, this, this guy or this, this team or this approach is not is not going to work for us. And, and uh, it, it turns out I also went to college with John Locke, who's uh, on our board and was on the Braintree board as well as now a partner at Excel. So that was helpful. <laughs> so you're, uh, and what did you, uh, just uh, to recount for what people, if they missed it, 
what have you said publicly about how much you raised, and what have you said publicly about sort of the scale that you're at at this stage? Yes, yeah, so we raised $21.5 million, which was quite a leap from being bootstrapped for nine years. Um, By the way, same, though, as, as what um, Brian Johnson did. He would raised nothing, raised about $20 million. Yeah, some interesting parallels. God willing, we could have some sort of exit like they've had. But, uh, yeah, so um, in terms of where we're at, like we at the time of the raise, we, we – announced that we have done $100 million in, in cumulative gross sales. It was like the stat we came up with to try to, like, I don't know, be impressive. Um, but, yeah, we, you know, we've done nearly – That's a lot, though, at what's your average transaction size. 40, 50 bucks yeah. an hour for tutoring. Um, but we've, we've, we're approaching 3 million hours of tutoring. Wow. Yeah. That's great. What yeah. an impact you've had on Yeah, it's awesome. Too. It's it's the coolest thing about our business is that we get to sit in the middle of these like amazing life experiences, incredible success stories. Um, and uh, yeah, being it's it's again goes back to the banking <laughs> pivot, like waking up feeling like super passionate about what you're doing is really um, really it's feel fantastic. feel very fortunate. Yeah, how cool. I mean, you know as a parent and as a student how important important that is. Um, I want to take some questions here, but one, one question, last question before we go to the questions from the crowd here. Please submit them and vote them up. Uh, is this business going to go virtual? Not your marketplace, but the tutoring part itself. Uh, it's going to be an important part of it. Um, I don't think the in-person experience is ever going to go away. Um, for those of you that have had a successful kind of in-person, whether it's whether it's formal, I hire a tutor and pay by the hour, or just uh, casual, like I'm sitting down with an expert and he's showing me how to how to code or whatever it may be. Like, there's something really magical about that in-person experience. Um, so we're not betting against that, but we are we are cognizant of the fact that the, there's a lot of benefits to the virtual experience. Whether it's you know you eliminate the geographic constraint, um, you know there there's kind of this real-time opportunity that it presents. Um, you know, and for us, matching is critical, right? Like that's our, one of the cores to our business is finding the right tutor for the right student. And obviously, you then open up, like, again, removing the geographic constraint. The right, the right tutor may be in Alaska. The right student may be in Florida. But that, you know, with virtual, you can, you can then match those two people together. So it's really important. Uh, but we also look at it as a complement to the in-person experience. If you can hook up with your tutor for 20 minutes on a Wednesday night to get help with your homework um, virtually, but then you meet every week or two, like, we think those two things work really well together. So we're investing behind that. Interesting. Interesting. Um, let's go to some questions here. So um, how did you go about the legal side of what you put together in the marketplace? First question. Um, so if, if that question is geared towards, like, we're in the business of mashing up tutors and students and there are things that could, you know, go wrong, um, we've been really lucky. There, there haven't been any, like, terrible incidents that have happened. The tutors are all, in our business, are all independent contractors. There's over a million tutors in our database and there's 75,000 active on the site and it's actually like you have to, there's a lot of scrubbing that goes into that 75,000. Those people are actually available for tutoring. Um, so they, they are by all standards independent contractors and legally speaking that, that goes a long way. So if, that, if that's the angle of the question, like that's the answer is, is the, by having them be independent contractors, we're, we're, just, we're just creating this marketplace. We're, in that sense, a listing service. Are there other screening or reference things you need to do as part of what? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we have background checks. Uh, we also have proficiency tests that we developed. And these have been in place since 2007. This is one of those kind of scalable things. We're like, oh, if we built this testing system, they could, you know, so you have, if you want a tutor calculus, you have to pass a, a relatively short calculus quiz. But if you don't know calculus, you're not going to pass, right? So there, there, there's that angle. And then the user feedback piece is, is super important to like um, identifying the, the good tutors versus the bad tutors. The, the marketplace mechanics go a long way towards uh, keeping it high quality. Um, K-12 question. Do you do business with public or private schools? And if so, how is it selling into K-12 education? Yeah, we, we don't. And uh, I, I've heard horror stories about selling into schools. I, so I can't comment on it. Um, we're fortunate that we can deal directly to consumers. Um, so, yeah. Okay. If you had to give advice to any new tech companies looking for customers, users, what would that be? How would you market a website today cheaply? Yeah, so if, if you don't have a revenue model, and so you're doing this all at an incremental cost, um, it's pretty challenging. Um, you know, for us, we had, we had, again, like LTV from the very beginning. Uh, and LTV K being lifetime value. 
and paid search was, was again, like the way we did it. Although I can tell you that from 2005 to, to now, paid, the paid search landscape has changed. And like, it's become way more competitive. You know, our CPCs might have been 50 cents for like our main keywords, and now they're, now they're $4.50. So fortunately, like we've also continued to step up our lifetime value. But uh, that's, that's a tough nut to crack. Um, so it was, it was 50 cents cost per click, and now it's 450. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's kind of just like for one of our yeah, yeah, main keywords. But, but to give you an example big, of what, what's yeah. changed, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty steep. Um, I, I wouldn't rule out the gorilla stuff. Like you see a lot of uh, brand ambassadors is kind of an angle that we're exploring. You know, get get out there and pound the pavement. Like not everything has to be virtual, and um, you know, drum up some support that way. High school football games. Man. Yeah, they still happen. <laughs> Um, what's your biggest challenge as a company in the education industry today? So we, it's interesting, we historically have identified first as a marketplace and second as an education company because ultimately we're not the educators, it's the tutors who are, who are fulfilling that part of the business. Um, I, I would say, frankly, all of the challenges of the, of the education system are perversely like benefiting the supplemental education space, so which, which is where we sit, so like the private sector. Because um, people are relying more on the private sector to solve for some of the inadequacies of, of the, uh, you know, the, the U.S. school system. Um, so we're fortunately not wrapped up in those challenges. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I can certainly go into those. In our, in our particular business, you know, the challenge right now is, is, is awareness. Like, um, we, we've gotten very sophisticated around online marketing. And when people are looking for tutors, we're great at finding them. But ultimately, tutoring is one of those point of need sort of things. So it's like your kid brings home a bad grade or not an adequate grade, and you say to yourself, okay, what are, the, what are my options? And if we're not in that, that stream of consciousness right now, only if people then resort to Google or resort to other channels to look for that tutor, then they will find us. So we need to move up in that, that thought process. And so that's kind of our biggest business challenge right now. Interesting. Um, how long does it usually take for a tutor to get their first customer? Good question. I should know that stat. I should have that down cold. Um, so it, this goes back to the liquidity and balancing supply and demand. Um, I will tell you that in, in our business and most other marketplaces that I've talked to, the founders, um, they, they do tend to um, bias towards one or the other. In our case, we've always biased toward the demand side because um, those are the customers we pay a lot of money for. In our, it's always been a little bit easier to generate supply. So you know, there, there's no guarantee that if you sign up as a tutor, you're going to get business. Like you have to, there's a competitive dynamic there, which actually serves us very well. Um, you have to make a, you have to fine tune your profile. You have to be re super responsive to job inquiries. Um, you know, you have to, you have to write really good emails when you're interacting with customers. So it, there's no guarantee you even get a customer. But uh, for tutors that are successful, the snowball effect starts happening. And we, our, our top tutor last year made like $140,000. Which is a big underappreciated aspect of our business is, is enabling these people um, to be tutors and be independent, do something they love. And this for me goes back to kind of like where I was at in 2005. Um, so it's not like we're just focused on the student experience. In fact, we're, we've probably historically been more focused on the supply side and building tools. Imagine for them going to your experience. college reunion and someone says, you look and say, oh, oh yeah, I tutor. They'd be like, oh, when are you going to get a real job? Yeah. Meanwhile, they're making $140,000 yeah. a year. No, it's awesome. There are a lot of real jobs that pay like that. Uh, wow, that's really cool. So um, uh, beyond guerrilla marketing and uh, cost, you know, Google AdWords, other things you've done to acquire customers? Yes, yeah, so word of mouth is a, is a big, that, that's a way to grow a business. And frankly, we haven't totally mastered it yet, but that's always been important. Um, it, it's always, it's really, it, at this moment, it's almost exclusively online marketing, but there's a lot within that. So whether it's affiliate or display or social. Do you see, do you see, you said, you know, Google AdWords has changed a lot. Do you see um, other things shifting? Do you see other things coming into the forefront? If you were looking at doing something new, is there a channel you'd look at or a part of the online channel? You'd say, boy, that, that seems like a, a, you know, it's a good, good arbitrage opportunity to get, get customers there. Yeah, so I, I keep hearing from all these other companies and, and our VC and stuff that social is like that new channel. And it's, we haven't honestly been able to totally crack it, although we haven't invested, I don't think, enough time there yet. It's like, it doesn't matter if, you have, if you're an early stage startup or you have 70 employees, you still have this resource allocation problem. And, and honestly, we haven't been able to devote enough resources to try and figure out social. So I can't say from my experience that's been, but I've heard some incredible success stories of people who've unlocked a ton of value there. Interesting. 
Uh, one last question we ask everybody always is, uh, you've built a great company. Everybody watching this who wants to do something like this would love to be able to dream of having the success you've had. Um, you talked about what your one big lesson would be. I guess I'd love to see what would your, what's your insight into Chicago as a place to do a startup? As you think about Chicago today, what are the strengths you see? And what are the things that you know still, still feel like they need to evolve? Yeah, so f I touched on this a little bit, but I, one thing to add to my remarks earlier is that the level of support and the just passion for making companies successful in Chicago is, is amazing. Like, you know, if I, I reach out to Pat and, um, you know, or, or Kevin Willer, or whoever it is that, like, has other things to do than, than deal with my emails, they'll go way out of their way to, like, help make sure companies that are up and coming in Chicago, like, are successful in Chicago. And, and so, like, just by reaching out, and, and I, I meet with other younger, you know, earlier stage companies and, and later stage companies, and just like that, that kind of mutual support is, is incredibly helpful in Chicago. Um, I would say the one thing, like the, the talent pool has been excellent, but it, now that we're trying to grow that at a much higher clip, there are challenges there. Um, so this is a plug, shameless plug, but we're, like we're hiring for engineers, product managers, um, you know, visual designers, U, UX designers, and uh, yeah, like there's not a, there aren't enough consumer tech companies in Chicago that have reached scale. Like, so for us, like hiring relevant people from like Grubhub, or orbits, you know, that's like perfect because those people have have under, understand two sided businesses. Like the online marketing channels that they're important to them are important to us. Um, it, for us, like at this stage, we're still not at that point of having these robust training programs and being able to hire junior people. We're getting there, like particularly on the engineering side. So we're starting to hire out of colleges and start training people up. But it, for, when you're kind of in the when at the beginning, it's interesting when you're at the beginning. Anybody will do. You just want somebody who's passionate, and you'll figure it out. And then you get into this growth phase, and you're like, you need people who, who can hit the ground running because you don't have time to offer training. And then ultimately, you get into this point where you, you can then have training programs and bring people up. But uh, yeah, so you know, the talent pool is great here. But for our business, there aren't a lot of marketplaces here. And so we're looking for specific domain expertise. is a bit challenging. But overall, Chicago's an awesome place, and it's been amazing to us. That's great. Well, what a great Chicago success story. We're glad to have you. Thanks yeah, thanks a lot, Pat. Appreciate it.